If you haven't done so, we have posted online our worship bulletins each week. Trish, our office admin superstar, does a great job with those each week. And you can go to uh, AikenChurch.com under the media tab. You'll find worship bulletins and would invite you if you need those to download those so that you can stay up to speed even at a distance with what is going on at Glory Baptist Church. Uh, just a reminder, if you uh, would like to give online, you can certainly do so. That is a blessing to us, and we appreciate your continued financial support. And uh, we have an online giving system that you can give through our church's website. If you go to, uh, again, AikenChurch.com, in the top right-hand corner, you'll find a little thing that says Give. Click there and follow the instructions, and it will walk you through. If you would like to get signed up for an ongoing um, gift that you would like to continue giving on a week by week or every other week or once a month or however you would like to give. You can set all that up through the website. If you don't know how to do that, there is a guide there, but we also have a couple of people who would gladly assist you in getting your account set up if you would like to do that. If so, please let us know or contact directly either David Baker or Ruth Eggstead and they will make sure that you get that set up. The company we use is trustworthy, fantastic organization. They do a great job and um, we are thankful to be partnering with them. Uh, if you haven't done so, share and like on Facebook. Uh, follow us here on Facebook so that you see all of our posts. Make sure that you're not missing uh, some of the great things, some of the great content that we're providing, whether it's Pastor Kevin's weekly messages for Sundays and Wednesdays or things for kid men or weekly uh, opportunities to to pray with myself and to have a, a daily devotion and all sorts of other content that we've been sharing. So so do like and follow and uh, make sure that you're not missing out on what we have. On our bulletins, we do include a number of prayer concerns. Um, the family of the week is Stephen Avon Pearson. The verse of the week is Psalm 25, uh, verses 4 and 5. Um, we are praying for Mark and Vicki Daniels' his daughter, Shelley, who's expecting a baby. Uh, we're also praying for the Hurd family. Adrian Hurd is expecting a child as well. Um, praying for um, a number of other people, including Dan Madura, who's got a new cancerous mass and is going to be having um, some chemotherapy to follow up with that. And so continue to keep Dan and uh, Shirley in your prayers. Uh, we appreciate that. Continued prayers for all sorts of people who are recovering from injuries and, and surgeries and other things that came before the COVID-19 crisis, whether it's a heart valve replacement or, or shoulder surgeries or knee surgeries and all sorts of other things. Lots to be in prayer for there. Praying, of course, for COVID-19 and the impact that that's been having on the world. If that's impacted you in some way, particularly um, if, if you are suffering, suffering economically and you need some help, please let us know. Uh, we are here to love, to serve, and to help. And uh, if we can help you in this time, um, we will certainly do our best to do so. Um, if you need some food, if you need some financial support, if you just need somebody to listen, let us know. We're here for you. And we will do our best to come alongside of you in this time of need and to help meet your needs. That reminds me, um, one thing that I do keep mentioning during my daily devotions and prayer time just be in prayer for our government leaders. This is not about one side or the other, whether you're red or blue or one party or the other. That has nothing to do with this. What I am saying is this is a very difficult time to lead um, and our leaders need our prayer. And so would challenge and encourage you to be in prayer for them. You don't have to like them. You don't have to agree with them. But if you're a Christian, you should pray for them. And uh, that's really all I have to say as far as that goes, just be in prayer. Help them uh, with your support and prayer that they may lead us well, that they may make good decisions, because uh, whatever they do is going to be a difficult decision, and uh, there's always going to be critics, and not everybody can be happy, and that's the difficult part of leadership. And so hopefully uh, they lead well in this season, and that is what I'm praying for. Pray for our men and women who serve all over the world, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Merchant Marines, Coast Guard, all kinds of ways, shapes and forms, people who who are police and sheriffs and um, fire and EMTs and nurses and doctors and 
people who have all kinds of other service industry oriented things, whether it's grocery store attendants and gas station attendants and uh, people who keep electrical lines working and repair all kinds of things that we need, pray for them, continue to pray for them. Pray for our schools, our teachers, our administrators. Pray for our parents who are stepping in and lots of times pulling a, a double duty, so to speak, as uh, educators and trying to figure out how to work. Continue to pray for those who, who are suffering economically in this season, be it from lost jobs or reduced income or, or whatever else it might be. Uh, keep, keep our brothers and sisters in prayer. Um, the world needs a lot of prayer. We are a people who believe in prayer and would invite you to pray for all of those things. Continue to pray for our missions, um, agencies. There's all kinds of missionaries that we support and all over the world, in fact, and we want to be in prayer for them. Um, the, the rest of the world is impacted as we are. We just have the luxury here in America to have an abundance of resources that much of the rest of the world does not. And so we need to keep um, our brothers and sisters in Christ in prayer around the world. Pray that the church would flourish. Pray that we would grow. Pray that each of us would grow in this season spiritually, that we would find ways during this time of social distancing to nonetheless draw closer to God and, and to pray for one another and to care for one another more so that when we do come back together, uh, we will fully come back together with the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power of the church behind us. That is what we want. Well, we are looking forward to seeing you, and uh, we don't know when that day will come, but until then, we are praying that you are well. Would you pre please join me in prayer? God, thank you again for this day, for this time that we have together. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you inspired it and gave it to us, and we now have a chance to draw near to you and then learn from it and hear from you, and just pray, God, that uh, your word today would find our hearts as a fertile soil, and that truly, God, it would not return void, that it would plant as a, a seed in fertile soil and flourish and grow, and that through that we might come to know love and serve you more. Thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. We praise you in the season of Easter for your son of Jesus, as we are so thankful for his sacrifice on our behalf and his great love for us. God, we thank you that you did not come into the world to condemn us, but to free us. What a beautiful and wonderful thing. Thank you for the joy that we have, uh, even though we're not together, Lord, that we can still have as a people of faith joined together. Lord, there's so much you have in store for us. I, I fully believe that you have great things in store for Glory Baptist Church and for the world beyond. And so God, looking forward to the chance to continue on with the work together when you bring us together. But until then, Lord, show us ways to love our neighbors. Show us ways to serve others. Show us ways to be generous and joyous in all things. To you be the glory, honor, and praise, Jesus. We love you and praise you. Amen. Well, so glad that you are here. I am Pastor Chris Myros of Glory Baptist Church. And if you haven't heard it, hear it now. Jesus loves you. If you have a Bible handy, why don't you open it up to Zechariah 4? We're going to look at verses 1 through 14, so all of Zechariah 4. Zechariah is an Old Testament prophet. It's one of the shorter books in the Old Testament, which can make it hard for some to find. But uh, if you have to use the index, that's okay. And go ahead and find Zechariah 4. I'm going to read it to you here from our Bible. If you would like to follow along, you can open it on your phone, whatever else you got. There in Zechariah 4 it reads, Then the angel who had been talking with me returned and woke me as though I had been asleep. What do you see now? he asked. I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl of oil on top of it. Around the bowl are seven lamps, each having seven spouts with wicks. And I see two olive trees, one on each side of the bowl. Then I asked the angel, What are these, my lord? What do they mean? Don't you know? the angel asked. No, my lord, I replied. Then he said to me, This is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by forth, force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, May God bless it! May God bless it! Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. 
Then you will know that the Lord of Heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the world. Then I asked the angel, What are these two olive trees on each side of the lampstand? And what are the two olive branches that pour out golden oil though through two gold tubes? Don't you know, he asked. No, my Lord, I replied. Then he said to me, They represent the two anointed ones who stand in the court of the Lord of all of the earth. There are three principles taught in this passage. Verses 1 through 6 are that God's work will be accomplished by God's Spirit. The second is that God's work must not be despised for its small beginnings, and you find that in verses 7 through 10. The third is God's work values people more than institutions. For today, I'll be focusing in on that second one, looking at the little things of life. Today is the beginning of a, a brand new four-part message series called, It's the Little Things. When I look at the lives of those who have it all together, or seem to at the very least, in, in some area of their life more than I do, I don't know about you, but sometimes it kind of intimidates me, right? I mean, I'll look at their lives and say, they are so much better at this area of life. I don't even know what are the big things that I need to do in order to get those same kind of results. I mean, I've got no idea at all the big changes I would need to make in order to get there. Now, I want to bring you some good news today if you've ever felt that same way. Because I really believe that it's often not the big changes that we need to make. But if you're taking notes, here's our key thoughts for this message series. That it's, it's often the, the small things that no one sees that result in the big things that everyone wants. Let me say that again because I really believe there's power in this thought. That it's not the big things, but it's often the small things that no one sees that result in the big things that everyone wants. People want a big temple, right? But very few people see all the small details that went in to it being built. Let me give you some real life examples. Back in what I would call my, my spiritual home church in Mitchell, South Dakota. It's a Northridge Baptist Church, one of our sister converge uh, churches. I was blessed to, to come upon a great group of spiritually mature men who, who blessed me enormously. They took me in kind of under their wings, and, and they were the leaders of my church, I came to eventually find out. I didn't know that initially, though. And they took me into their men's group Bible study. And in that first year I was there, they began to show me how to love Jesus, how to love his church, how to love their wives and their families and their kids, and how to run their businesses with integrities and, and in ways that, that glorify God. And, and, and it was just a great opportunity for me. And, and there was this one guy in particular, uh, the guy who led that Bible study, and his name is Alan. And, and he really, really impressed me. His knowledge of Scripture absolutely just, just blew me away. Uh, I mean, how did he get so smart? He wasn't, he wasn't a pastor or anything. He'd never gone to seminary. I don't even think he went to a Bible college. But, but man, did he know his Bible. So I asked him how he got to be like that. I mean, he knew more about the Bible than anyone I had ever known personally. And you know what he told me his secret was? He'd been reading through his Bible for 20 years. He said every year just reading through his Bible front to back. And he seemed to know every single passage. He had an answer to every question out of the Bible that I might have. It was truly amazing. And it was, frankly, intimidating. I remember thinking and, and honestly sharing with him, I didn't think I could probably ever get to that level. I mean, it was like, whoa, he was, he knew, he was the Bible answer man. He, he knew his Bible. I didn't think I could ever get there. And I'd never read through the Bible cover to cover at that point. And, 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 and just the idea of all of that almost kind of scared me a little bit. But he said, no, you can, you can do it. You can read through the Bible just like I do. And uh, he grabbed out his Bible and he thumbed all the way to the back and he said, here's the page number and 
however many pages it was, he divided that by 365, which is, of course, the days in a year. And he said, that's how many pages you've got to read in a day. And he said, I, I sit down and I do that. And, and it takes me roughly eight to ten minutes in most days to do my portion of reading. And then he said, and then I'll spend about five minutes in prayer. And then I go about my day. And he said, that's my so-called secret. That's not a secret. He said, that's all I do. He said, 15 minutes a day. And I'm like, 15 minutes to make this spiritual giant 15 minutes every day and he said yeah he said every day I just I sit down I read I pray and I go about my day and he said after the last 20 years of doing that I've grown so much and God has blessed me so much that I just keep on doing it and after I heard him say that I was like wow I think I could actually do that and he assured me it really is that simple so I was like, all right, challenge accepted, I guess. I'll, I'll give it a try. And so I started, and what do you know, like nine months later or so, I had read all the way through the Bible for my very first time. And look where it got me now. This was long before seminary had ever entered into my mind. Long before I had any inkling of thought that I might become a pastor. This was before I had ever led a youth group. This was before I would ever sang on a praise team or done any sort of leadership in a church. But look where it got me. It's the little things. That small change has made a gigantic difference in my walk and relationship with God. Let me give you one other example quick. Back when I was in high school, I was a football player, basketball track. I threw shot put and discus and all those kind of things. But back when I played football in high school, I couldn't bench press 215 pounds. I did a shaky 205 pounds once my senior year. Most days, though, 185 pounds was, was all that I could get off of me. I wanted to be stronger, but I didn't really spend much time lifting weights. It really hadn't fully come into the sports world at the high school level at that point yet to that that everybody was already lifting at, you know, age, you know, 10 and, and so on. Like we have today, we have great programs here in our local schools where, you know, we've got kids starting in seventh grade on lifting weights and doing stuff like that. But that didn't really exist back when I was in high school, right? And so, so, so lifting weights wasn't something that I'd really ever made a priority of mine. Well, then I graduated from high school and I started to play college football. And you know what we did all summer long, we lifted weights. Yeah, we threw the football around some too, but every single day, five days a week, before my freshman year of college, all summer long, I was in the weight room with some freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors who were on the football team, and in there just lifting with them each and every day. And that summer between my senior year of college and my freshman year of college, or my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college, my bench press went up 80 pounds. Now, if you don't bench press and you don't know weightlifting, that's a lot. A few years after that, I bench pressed over 400 pounds for the very first time. And you know how that happened? Well, first, of course, God gifted me with this fabulous body, right? But it took an awful lot of days of working in the gym. It was a lot of sweat, a lot of hard work. And it was a lot of very small improvements. My goal was to add five pounds to my bench press each and every month. Now, if you don't know about the, the plates that you use on a bench press bar, five pounds equals to two and a half pounds on each side of that bar. And two and a half pounds are what we call the pennies. Those little tiny plates, we call them pennies when we were lifting. They were the tiniest, the smallest increment that was possible to add onto the bar. And, and, and when you're only adding the smallest little plates, that can be kind of hard on the ego. But when you add it up over 12 months, if I'm able to do that each and every month, add the equivalent of one small plate on each side each and every month, 
I have grown my bench press in a year by 60 pounds of strength. Keeping at it, being faithful in the small things is what made it possible. It's the little things. If you want change in your life, chances are it's not the big things that you think, but it's often the small things that no one sees that result in the big things that everyone wants. And so what I want to do today is to build a foundation. We're going to be in Zechariah chapter 4. You heard me read it earlier. And if you want to follow along as I preach, go there in your Bibles now or feel free to open up your phone to it or grab out the iPad. And, and, and honestly, in this day and age, when you, when you pull out your phone and you, you look up, you know, whatever Bible verse, I use you version, and you grab out your, your, your phone Bible, or you grab out the iPad or you do it on your computer, it almost feels like cheating, right? I mean, I can find any book really fast when I do it on my phone. But when I grab my paper Bible and somebody says, find Zechariah, I'm like, okay. Right? Anybody else doing that right now with their paper Bibles? It takes you a minute to find Zechariah. That's why my Old Testament and a bunch of my Bibles actually have indexes so it's easier to find. Because some of those books in the Old Testament, they can be a little bit difficult to find. So we're going to be in Zechariah chapter 4. And let me give you some of the context of Zechariah chapter 4. During the time when this was written, the temple had been destroyed and God's people had been living in captivity. So it was a, a low point in, in the Israelites' history. Uh, it was effectively like, we don't have a, a house for God and we're not even in the place where we're supposed to be. And so the people of God were very depressed. And in the year 537 BC, Zerubbabel led a remnant of people back to Israel. And so there was some hope finally. We're, we're, we're getting back to our land where we're supposed to live. And then 18 years later, God spoke to King Zerubbabel and he said, I'm going to give you the power to rebuild the temple. So with that, let's start in at verse 6 of Zechariah 4. And we'll read it and let it speak to us. And I'll read it to you again here. This is what the Lord said to Zerubbabel. It's not by force nor by strength. In other words... The temple's not going to be built in a way that you get credit for it, but it's going to be built by my what? It's not by force, not by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Now here's the thing. You can try to change you and you can try to do things in your own power, but if you'll, if you'll just, you know tap into something greater than just you. You'll find amazing things can be done. If you rely on your own power, yes, you can make some incremental improvements by your own power. But if you'll tap into a power that is greater than what you possess, if you'll tap into the power of the Holy Spirit, His Spirit is made perfect in your weakness. And not by our effort, and not by our might, and not by our power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, He can transform you. You can try your best all day long to make all the, your changes that you want to make, but when you tap into the Spirit of God, there is a strength there beyond what you can muster up on your own. And some of you listening today and watching today, maybe you've tried for years to change something, right? To improve something. And you just can't seem to do it. Maybe this is the year. Maybe right now is the time. Maybe in the middle of the COVID crisis, right? Not by your will, not by your might, not by your power, but by His Spirit, says the Lord. God says, I'm going to give you, Zerubbabel, this power to rebuild this temple. And we as the people of God can tap into that same power through the Holy Spirit. And then verse 7 says, Nothing... Not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. In other words, when God calls someone to do something, there is no force on this earth that can stop the power and the will of God through that person. And then he goes on to say, And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, May God bless it! I love that. May God bless it. 
I love the fact that even before the construction starts, God already sees the end. Before you even attempt to do what what God may put on your heart that you need to change, God knows what results can be if we will simply surrender to the power of his spirit. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, Then another messenger came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. If you'll pause there for a moment, uh, I did a little, a little bit of research on the background of the story, and what I found is that the initial phase of construction was actually very awkward. It went rather slowly. And if you read in the book of Ezra, there were times when people had, had visited the early stages of the construction. And when they, when they saw literally how little had been accomplished, they cried. I mean, they, they cried. They were so disappointed at how slow it was going. The Israelites were crying. Some people believe they cried because they were happy because the temple was being rebuilt. But I don't think that's the case. I think it's because the disappointment of how slow it was going, how long it was taking. And so these people would come and they'd see how little had been done. And they'd be like, man, I thought there'd be more. This is pathetic, right? This is unimpressive. There's just like a few rocks barely stacked on one another here. This isn't ever going to amount to anything. And the reality is, when we're trying to make change in our own lives, we might often feel the same way as well. Maybe you want to grow spiritually, right? But you feel like you you simply can't know it all and that there's so much in the Bible that, that you don't understand and you're thinking it's just too hard for you and it's just too much and I can't do it and I can't get there. Maybe, maybe you tried Bible reading plans before, right? And you read for three days in a row, right? But then you missed one. And you might have read for a couple more days, then you missed two or three days, and then you read for one day, and then pretty soon that, that where, where's, anybody seen my Bible? I don't even remember where I left it, right? And somewhere, you know, you gotta, gotta blow the dust off it when we find it. I don't know about you, but I've been there before. That happens to us. Or maybe, maybe you're like, oh, I, I want to be, be a person of prayer. I want to pray more. We, the church did 21 days of prayer. I'm going to pray. And, and so you, you got down on your knees and you prayed. And then you're like, oh, that's kind of painful. I'm not doing that tomorrow. So, so, you, so okay, I'm going to sit in a chair and pray. And So you prayed for a second day. First day was on your knees and it was painful. You sat in a chair the second day and you prayed. Well, then about halfway through the prayers, you started to, to zone out. Well, you, but you got some prayers. And the third day, well, uh, I'll sit in the chair again, right? And you sit down in the chair and you're about to pray. Well, your phone dings and now pretty soon you're in text conversation. Oh, now I've got to go do something. The kids are yelling and now off you go. And all of a sudden you, you, you didn't pray at all, right? And the next day you don't even go back to the chair. You don't even go and spend any time praying. And, it, and it's so easy for things like that to happen. And we begin to question ourselves like, can I even do this? And we may even question, is there any value in me trying, right? And so we get embarrassed because we failed, and then we don't want to try again. And, and we get frustrated by it, and we say we don't want to try again. But, but here's the deal. So many great things in this world started off small and simple. We just have to keep at it and keep trying. And don't allow ourselves to become discouraged. Think about this. You've heard of Google before, right? I mean, who hasn't? If you're watching this, you're watching it digitally, and my guess is you know what Google is at this point. Did you know that Google started as a school project? It was like, like homework for a class kind of school project. It was two kids from Stanford who started it. And look what it's become. And Jesus says to us, if we just have the faith of a mustard seed, then we could do incredible things. It can start with something small. It's the little things. Verse 10 says this, and I hope this will be encouraging for some of you. It says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. So you've got to lay one stone down 
before you can put down the second stone if you're building a temple. You've got to start somewhere. And God rejoices to see you be faithful in the small things. One of the challenges so often, we look at people and we see the highlight reel of their lives. We don't know the behind the scenes mess, right? It's one of the dangers of the internet. It's one of the dangers of Facebook and Instagram and all these other formats where where we get to see the daily highlights of people's lives and we don't get to see the mess that they're not showing. And so because we see this highlight reel, right, we get intimidated. And you might look at people in the Bible and you're like, look at David. He was a a man after God's own heart. He took down Goliath and and I want to take down my giant. But, But we forget that David was was faithful for years in the field tending sheep before Goliath. And that whenever a wild animal would come up, he would run off the animal or he would kill that animal. What was happening there? Well, he was learning to be faithful with the small things so that God could trust him with the big things. People look at, at Ruth and Boaz, right? Great story. I love the story of Ruth. One of my favorite stories in all the Bible. And then, and people will look at that and, and, and women will be like, yeah, I want to find my Boaz, right? Boaz sounds awesome. He sound, I mean, just sounds like I need a Boaz. But you forget in the story that Ruth was faithful to Naomi when she didn't have to be, when it would have been easier, frankly, not to be. She was faithful out in the fields for years and years, time and time again, long before she'd ever run into Boaz. And it was that faithfulness, actually, that opened the doors of God's blessing through Boaz. It was the things that no one saw that resulted in the marriage that everyone wanted. We look at Daniel in the Bible. You look at Daniel and you're like, oh man, that guy's got some amazing faith. I mean, he's standing in the lion's den. His faith is unwavering, right? I want to be able to fight just like Daniel. We forget though, that three times a day, year after year after year, you know what Daniel did? He stopped whatever he was doing and he knelt down three times a day and sought the Lord in prayer. What kind of faith do you think you would have if you devoted three specific times a day, every single day, to seeking after God? Because again, it's the little things that no one sees that result in what everyone wants. A number of years back, I I read this truly fantastic book, a book called Wooden on Leadership. It was about John Wooden, uh, one of the greatest coaches of all time for basketball. He coached at UCLA. He had 10 NCAA titles, seven consecutive titles from 1967 to 1963. And, and you know what the very first practice consisted of for Coach Wooden each year? Coach Wooden would bring in these, these superstar college players, guys like Lou Cinder who became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and many others that he coached. He would bring in these highly skilled, highly accomplished players. He'd bring these players in and he didn't run any drills in that first practice. He didn't run any sprints. He didn't practice any free throws. They didn't practice any passes. The very first practice consisted of sitting down and putting your socks on and putting your shoes on the right way and being very careful about doing it. Because he found that no one ever thinks about how you put on your socks and how you put on your shoes and therefore guys will get blisters and guys with blisters can't play basketball very well. And he made a very important point that we're a team that's going to care about the details because details matter. In fact, John Wooden said this, it's the little things that are vital. Little things make the big things happen. I love that. It's so often that the small things that no one sees that result in the big things that everyone wants. So so here's what we're going to do in the coming weeks. We're going to focus on three very important areas. We're going to focus on our thoughts, on our words, and on our habits. 
Why are our thoughts so important? Well, our thoughts are important because our thoughts become words. Our words become actions. And our actions become habits. And our habits create our destiny. Next week, we're going to look at making some small changes in our words. Because as a person thinks in their heart, so they become. You want to change your life? Start by changing your thoughts. Then in week number three, we're going to talk about our words. Because there's, there's the power of life and death in our words. You want to change, our, change your life? Change the words you speak. You want to change the way you live? Change the words that you speak and then take it to that next level. And then in week four, we're going to talk about our habits. Why? Because we become what we repeatedly do. You want to be somebody different? You want to improve in some area of life? You want to become a different person? Change your habits. We're going to make some small changes in the way we think, in the way that we speak, and then in the way that we behave. And it's in those small changes that maybe no one else will notice that will bring about the results that I believe that we have always wanted. Because it's, it's impossible to describe the power of a focused life. When you focus in on this and when you work at this and you, you pick something out that you want to improve on and you make those little changes time and time again and you commit yourself to doing it, you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. Now, I would challenge you to think of just one thing in the next three weeks that you want to work on. Change can only happen at a certain pace and you can't change everything at once. None of us can withstand that sort of change. You can see the chaos that we got thrown into when, when businesses got shut down and schools got shut down and we as a church aren't meeting together corporately even though we're all together on the internet at the moment. Lots of change at once can cause a lot of havoc. But we can sustain small changes very well. And God created us to handle those small changes well. And so I would challenge you to think, even right now, maybe God's putting something putting right on your heart at the moment, what that one thing is that you want to change. Think that through, because we're going to talk about this for the next three weeks. And then and, and think of what it is that you can do to make those changes. And we'll talk more about this for the next three weeks, as I said. Make that your number one desire. Make that thing your focus. Desire to have God's presence working with you through the power of the Holy Spirit in that thing. So that maybe when you're done, you could be like David and be described as a, a man and woman after God's own heart as, as he gets the glory for these incredible changes that begin to take place in your life. There is power in focus. And so pick one thing that you can work on. Now, Paul in the New Testament probably the greatest apostle of all time, if you remember who he was. Paul had this kind of crazy background, right? He had had an incredibly interesting past before he was a Christian. And then, of course, if you know his Christian story, the Apostle Paul, uh, just, just an amazing story. Um, he faced massive persecution. He was beaten, shipwrecked, left for dead, bitten by snakes. He was hungry. He was stoned. He was in prison. And, and maybe you don't remember of what he said, but, but, but instead of saying, oh, you know, I'm going to dwell on my past, and oh, it's been rough, and I've, I've had so many difficulties, there's been so many people fighting against me, and oh, those people were so mean to me, right? They persecuted me, and oh, Paul felt bad for himself, right? Wrong. He never did that. That wasn't Paul. You know what Paul said? He said, this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining on towards what is ahead. Paul said, I'm not going to let my past define my future. God has something more in store for me. So, so this one thing that we're going to focus on, we want to focus on that and, and let go of those other things. If this is something we've been trying to work on, trying to improve on, and we failed before, that's okay. That's in the past. 
We're going to work on it this time. We're going to move forward with it this time. I'm going to move forward this time because I'm going to do it with the power of God with me. And when we focus on that one thing, it's amazing what God can do. So I would challenge you, even right now, think about what is, if there's one thing that I want to change, one thing I want to improve in, one thing I want to be better at, what is that one thing? Jesus, he visited the home of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. Mary was enjoying the presence of Jesus, and and Martha, of course, she's freaking out in the story. And Jesus looked at her and he said, Martha, you're upset about so many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary, who was sitting at the feet of Jesus, he says, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. See, he's saying that she's missed out on the most important thing. We need to focus. Here's another example out of the Bible. Jesus encountered a a very wealthy, successful young business person. And this guy wanted to follow Jesus, right? He's like, hey, I want to be on your team, Jesus. And the problem was the, the material possessions had become so important to him. And he was missing the true blessing of becoming a follower of Christ. And so Jesus said, hey, you only lack just one thing. And only one thing, just one thing. You get this one thing right, and you can help change the world. You lack one thing, though, pal. Go and sell your possessions and give all that stuff away. Don't let it weigh you down. And then come follow me. You know what happened in that story, though? It says the guy went away sad because he was unwilling to do the one thing that would change his life. It's an amazing thing what what a life that's focused on one thing to change, what it can bring, what it can do. Because it's often the small things that no one sees that results in the big things that everyone wants. So again, here's your assignment. Very simple, very focused, very direct, and very doable. What I'm going to challenge you is to get yourself to a place where you can be as focused as you can be. If you try to pick three things you want to change, my guess is none of them are going to get changed. Pick one thing. What I want you to do is I want you to ask and seek God for one specific thing that will define and direct for the next three weeks, for the next month, that will define and direct what you're going to focus in and work on. For just one month. And then ask God to show you, to help you in that one thing. Because this is not going to be by your might or by our power, but it's going to be done by God's Spirit that He will empower us to move forward and to make that change, to make that improvement. And you will not believe how different your life can be even just one month from now and then a year from now. And then how different your life can be as you focus on God and using His power to make the changes in your life that you need to make. Allow God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to guide those decisions in the direction of your life. Because you know what God loves? God loves when we are faithful in the small things. And it's in those being faithful moments in all of the small things that He'll say to us one day, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the small things, so guess what? You're promotable. I can now trust you with even bigger things. And when people look on at our lives and they wonder how it is that our lives are so different, and they're like, what? They can't even fathom. And you can simply say, you know what? It's really not the big things, but the small things that God put on my heart. Because when you focus in on that one thing at a time, it's amazing what God will accomplish through you. It's the little things. Let's pray. Lord God, again, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this time and we thank you for the chance to hear of of this story where you had called Zerubbabel and the people to begin rebuilding the temple and to some, Lord, it seemed like a foolish task and to some, Lord, it seemed like it would never get done. But Lord, they kept at it and they remained faithful. And and we know from the story of, of their success And so, God, we hope that 
we pray that you would help us to be, to be faithful, even when nobody's looking, to be faithful in the details, to be faithful in what it is you've put on our hearts and what you've put in front of us. God, we want to be faithful with the small things so that you, God, would trust us with even more. And in that, God, so that you would get all the glory. God, thank you so much for, for strengthening us, for your steadfast faithfulness, for putting up with us when we fail and we quit and, and we turn our backs and we choose not to pursue the things that we should. God, thank you that you don't give up on us and that you keep on bringing us back and giving us new opportunities each and every day. So God, I just pray that you would, you would even now convict us of the things we need to change, but that we would focus in on just one of them, the one that might matter most to you. And God, just help us in the days and weeks to come to live a focused life that through the power of your Spirit, we might... Make that one change in it, giving you all the glory that the world might see it and be amazed at your work. Lord, we thank you that you can see the end before the beginning, that you have a plan and that you are working through all things for the good of your people. And God, we are truly humbled that you have loved us and chosen us and that you continue to do so. We thank you for that in this post-Easter season. We are reminded of your abundant and great love. Each and every day, God, we are reminded that you love us. Every day that we draw breath is a good and glorious gift from you. We have reason to give praise and thanks. So thank you for all of your blessings, God. And God, as we move forward from this day, may this be a day where we've planted our flags and said, we are going forward with you to do great things for your glory. Lord, may we be ones who make much of you and may your power empower us truly to be your hands and feet wherever you might send us and whatever you would have us do. We pray this in the beautiful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, again, thank you for spending a little bit of time with us, stopping by digitally here to Glory Baptist Church. It's been a, a blessing to share God's word with you and if we could be a blessing to you, if we could pray for you, if we could love you, if we could serve you in some sort of way, please let us know. You can leave a comment. Uh, you can like this post. You can share this post with friends and family. And, and let us know how we could come alongside of you and help you in this journey of the small things to do amazing things through the power of God for his glory. Have an awesome week. Looking forward to what God is going to do with you. Wash your hands often. Make much of Jesus always. Go and serve your king.